Victor E. Farrell Jr. And there's a period there. Artist in residence. It's not a junior artist residency. It's a, it's a full residency. And I'd like to thank you all for coming um, to the lecture that is tied into that program. Our speaker for the evening is an accomplished and prolific artist whose works have appeared in the Tate Modern, Gallery, Annalee Forever, Farg Fabrican Center for Contemporary Art and Architecture, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, and On the Ground. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> his work has been featured in such storied publications as Freeze, that's I-E, not like a frozen thing, Contemporary, just one word, Flash Art, Art Forum, Art World Magazine, Alt Papers, and Sculpture, which is a, a book and not a sculpture. His work explores spaces, economies, and agency of objects, things, and our relation to both. When he is not carving wooden, wooden facsimiles of everyday objects, he is teaching as a professor of studio art at the School of Art and Design at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For those interested in seeing some of his work firsthand, a collection of his works, untitled project Robert Smithson's Library and Book Club, is on display in the Wright Museum through October 10th. And now, without further ado, the Victor E. Farrell Artist in Residence, Professor Conrad Bacher. It's on, can you hear me? All right. Uh, thank you um, for the introduction and thanks to Bloyd College, to the art faculty, the students, it's been great to be here and work with uh, the students in the um, workshop that we've been doing. Um, and for those who are in the workshop, some of this might actually sound like what we've been talking about in, in part. Um, to give a brief overview of this presentation, I'm gonna first talk about my work kind of using a theoretical framework, not because theory is the most important thing, but because or even the most interesting thing, but because it's a useful tool that will help contextualize my studio practice. And the second part um, will be a very quick sprint through a large number of projects, followed by a closer examination of some specific projects. Um, as a way to, I can't talk about everything that I've made, I've learned, unless you want to be here for a long time. So I'm gonna, I'll talk about um, a few of them more in depth. I use untitled projects as a faux corporate identification. It serves as a subtle distancing mechanism and also as a simple cataloging method that allows me to do a, a large series of different but interrelated projects. I describe my untitled projects as sculptures that are fake versions of real things, intentionally constructed by hand out of wood and paint and designed to move somewhat awkwardly through a given economic system, bumping and denting a trail, revealing a trajectory that begins to make tangible the processes of production, distribution, and exchange that surround things. One of the goals of this work is to create an anomaly, a strange thing that gives pause to the quickness of consumption, interrupting perhaps momentarily the irresistible forces of late capital. To do this, I deliberately orient my artworks as things, as gatherings, as networks of relations directly concerned with some specific issues of representation or the simulation of things, labor, uh, the making of things, and economies, and by economies I mean the relations of things. I'll kind of break those down a little bit before I get into the work. In my studio work, I'm interested in rep representational strategies, representation in the traditional sense of making sculptures that represent other things in the world. These sculptures are simulations, stand-ins, props, or surrogates that use basic tricks of illusion to fool the eye. So these images are not necessarily my work. This is more of my research, um, kind of visual research. We make artificial versions of real things for many reasons, promotion, camouflage, control, substitution, or even trickery. One of the more interesting uses for representation is its capacity for generating an understanding of the real thing, even though it's not. I've come to believe that we do not get closer to the real if we make the artifice more believable or realistic, that perhaps we get a better understanding of the real when we become aware of the distance between the constructed artifice 
and us and the real. Which is to say that if we're aware of how the illusion is working, um, how the artifice is working, we might get a better understanding of what we understand by the word real. <clears throat> this, of course, is a, a Yeti crab that they was discovered by one of those deep sea submarines in 2006 and instantly it gained internet fame. And one of the immediate sort of um, responses to this new creature, new to us creature, was to make a felt um, and kind of fabric version of it. And, and I, I use this as an example to kind of talk about how the, the gesture to understand or the desire to understand something that is so removed from us um, by making a fake version of it is actually a genuine response. It's, it's, it's a way to kind of deal with the thing that you can't touch or to deal with the phenomenon of something new. Of course, this happens a lot on the internet as ways to understand the things that we don't understand. Um, As I've mentioned, the objects I make are carved out of wood and painted with oil paint. They're rather crude versions of the real thing, and they're designed to fall apart visually the closer we get to them, the way that paint in a still life is both paint and part of the representation. One might say that the life of these things as things begins at the very moment that they fall apart and reveal themselves. I'm also interested in representation that utilizes rep <laughs> repetition and by re repetition occurs when these sculptures go beyond just looking like their real counterparts, but also occupying time, space, and habits of the original, extending the double take as meditation on the thing, of the thing and its relations. Labor, handwork. I make objects by hand using tools, but this making has less to do with the fetish fetishization of craft and more concerned with making things by hand, by myself, as a deliberate strategy to draw attention to the specificity of labor, my labor, the time it takes to make something. Hand production generates a visible identification that forces an attention to the act of construction itself. The handmade thing, I believe, reveals the body that made it, but also starts to point to the body that's viewing it drawing attention to adjacent acts of production that are simultaneously occurring. So the production of capital, the production of space, the production of affect, et cetera. In other words, the facture of a thing, um, the rev revelatory madeness of a thing has the strange capacity to reveal the political and social economies of both the space in which it's situated and the participants and things therein. Arjun Apatarai, in The Social Life of Things, writes, we have to follow the things themselves for their meanings are inscribed in their forms, their uses, their trajectories. In my studio research, I'm interested in things that are in motion, things that are moving through time and space, and in the process reveal their stories, things that have agency, things that are actively changing us and the world and revealing their network of relations, economies. In part, this is a strategy to shift the conversation from the ontological status of the object, that is like the inert modernist object on the pedestal, what we call sculpture sometimes or stereotypically, to other interesting and relevant questions of power and position and purpose. And I use examples of this, I use examples of this in, in the uh, workshop that I've been doing about how objects on the curb reveal what their intent is. Um, some, like the computer monitor that's available versus the computer monitor next to the building that is reserved or the flower pot that is slightly pushed away from the garbage to indicate possible reuse or the lost scarf. Um, in, in Chicago in the winter if you, um, it, when it snows and you shovel out your parking spot if you build a sculptural installation where your car used to be, and if that sculpture, this is an important part, if the sculpture is good enough, you can save your spot um, until the end of the day when you return. Um, and I use this as an example of ways, ways in which space is being held by um, not only things, just kind of the bulk ordering of things, but also the way that things can be arranged. 
In the end, I believe that artworks as things are physically political in their very production and occupation of space, in their participation in the distribution, exchange, consumption, and accumulations of various forms of capital. And I believe that things can be politically productive when they become platforms around which we gather and debate, when they empower their users, but also when they generate frictions, when they resist. Ultimately, I'm interested in things that resist. We live in a world and a time where capitalism is global, dominant, and pervasive, and most attempts to counter its effects are futile. Mark Fisher, author of the book Capitalist Realism, describes it as, as a pervasive atmosphere, conditioning not only the production of culture, but also the regulation of work and education, and acting as a kind of invisible barrier, constraining thought and action. It's oppressive. But he also argues that the tiniest event can tear a hole in the gray curtain of reaction, which has marked the horizons of possibility. So the tiniest event can make something happen. From a situation in which nothing can happen, suddenly everything is possible again. I subtitled this talk, Persuasive Fictions and Recalcitrant Things, to frame the importance of art in this time, at this moment. In the end, I believe that logic can't defeat fictions. Particular, particularly the entropic fictions of advanced capitalism. If you think about capitalism as a very persuasive fiction. I would argue that only strange, searing, and even more persuasive fictions can defeat and replace the current fictions. <coughs> Our hope for the future might be thought of as um, that there has to be a better fiction than the one that we are currently inhabiting. In my work, I want to make resistant things, things designed to be anomalies, awkward objects with physical glitches that slow down and or create tensions within a specific site or economic system. As I introduced the work earlier, bumping and denting a trail that outlines a pocket of resistance, a space of possibility, or a promising fiction. So over the past 15 plus years, I've produced a large number of entitled projects that have engaged, again, economic critique, institutional context, and representational strategies using carved and painted sculptures that include garage sales, mail order catalogs, pyramid schemes, Kool-Aid stands, gift cards, more gift cards, mixed mix tape swaps, free, TV, um, free TVs, gifting books about the gift, trading maple syrup in Vermont, bartering paintings of barter images on Craigslist, selling Tupperware on eBay, selling paintings of Eames chairs on eBay, <laughs> sending email spam quoting Karl Marx in order to sell fake carved and painted Rolex watches, a paperback bookshop in Geneva, a record shop selling albums from the 1960s in Paris, a record shop of 45s featuring songs about love or protest, science fiction DVDs for a genomic biology institute, a year-long subscription of Art Forum magazines from 30 years ago designed to arrive in subscribers' mailboxes with their current subscription. Mm -hmm. A Book of the Month Club, a used book sale, free self-help books to those who need to help themselves, specific books that are face down on the floor, specific catalogs face down on the floor, clearance catalogs, specific books with lawn chairs, specific books with Eames rocking chairs, specific books on designer tables, other specific books on designer tables. Rocks on art form magazines open to ads on designer tables. There's a lot of categories here. Rocks on art form magazines, art form magazine advertisements, specific art form magazines in museum bookstore shopping bags, specific books, um, the book Empire in what is now a bankrupt bookstore shopping bag, or a specific DVD in what is now a bankrupt video store shopping bag. Specific books as doorstops, conceptual art, hipster caps, <coughs> table signs, neon signs, bank signs, post-it notes, more post-it notes pointing to flaws, roadside arrow signs with instructions, clearance signs, sale banner signs, traffic cones, products left back on store, placed back on store shelves and left behind, products left behind on Kmart shelves products placed on thrift store shelves and left behind, things placed to other things on the sidewalk and left behind, Hot Wheels cars parked next to their real counterparts, 
tables with art food, art opening food debris, muted TVs, digital projectors, <coughs> and branded walls, Eames tables, um, paintings of Eames tables from online auctions, uh, carved and painted Eames tables, paintings of Bauhaus photographs, sculptures of Bauhaus photographs, specific paperback books, and free beer. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some specific projects um, and go a little bit deeper into some of the ideas, logistics, outcomes, some of the stories, let's say. Um, and these projects are, as the projects I just showed you, are not necessarily chronological, they're, but they're arranged to build a series of questions about things, economies, and strategies of resistance. And I showed a couple of these, or referred to a couple of these earlier. Untitled Project Garage Sale. Um, this is in 1997 um, and came out of a result of a gallery experience, a gallery show that was, um, I was negotiating with the gallery about doing an exhibition. They got frustrated with my ideas challenging the space and so it ended up not happening. Um, and I was left in my studio at the time surrounded by all of these objects that had been accumulating and I decided that I'd do my own show on my front lawn and I would call it a garage sale. So I, I advertised it as a garage sale and I also told all of my friends on my mailing list. Um, and it created a space that I didn't really know what to, I didn't anticipate what was gonna happen. It was just more of a reactive project. Um, and I became interested in how the, the work revealed both the private and public space of a garage sale, how looking at a garage sale at other people's things for sale is both a judgment that we make on those people, good and bad, let's say, um, as well as revealing our own kind of pro proclivity to certain objects or certain things. Um, the garage sale lasted for one day. Um, and at this point in this work, I wasn't ready for the question that I should have been ready for, um, like how much is this? Of course, a garage sale is an is a economic space and I didn't really anticipate that for some reason. And so when I came back with a price that was similar to the gallery pricing structure, of course, the conversation just like ended and <laughs> it, was, it was more about, okay, this is art, we're viewing it. So it was a learning, it was a learning moment for me. The next project uh, became an extension of the garage sale, but I began looking at mail order catalogs that don't, that's with a demo, demise of Sky Mall, we're kind of losing all of these fancy objects in our lives. Um, but I was looking at uh, Sharper Image, Hammaker Schlemmer, um, all these objects that promise a better life, stronger, faster, et cetera. Um, this is a project that I was able to produce through Creative Capital Foundation, um, kind of giving me funding to get this catalog printed and then mailed. Um, and I was thinking about, um, so I, I, would, I would collect these kind of scraps from these existing catalogs and I'd make the object um, based on those images from those existing catalogs. Um, and then I'd photograph the object and I would design it into this catalog and mail it out. Um, I also, the price econ econom economy part, I priced it at the approximate value of the real thing so that it became this kind of, this moment of tension of okay, th this object is only as valuable or is as valuable, not as an art object, but as the real thing. Thinking about that equivalence as being another way to kind of extend um, the illusion or kind of the problem of these things. Um, it was a fake catalog, but it was fully functional. Uh, I was interested in pointing to and breaking down the abstraction or the fragmentation of commodities and that culture and channeling it, kind of funneling that that process or that business entity through my studio practice. Um, in the design of the catalog, I was very interested in the way that the play of objects on facing pages would, um, would create both similarities or tensions or connections between the electronic dictionary and the nose hair trimmer. I, it was a totally functioning catalog in that the 800 number went to my cell phone. I collected the orders. Um, I re collected the, the reservation of the object. I collected the orders through the mail. Um, I would make the objects. I, I would ship the objects. 
um, and deal with customer relations when, whenever that would happen. Of course, the small print allowed me 180 days to make everything. Um, I would make multiple objects as the orders would come through. And then after the summer, um, the project ended. Um, participating in this project involved both getting a pretty good deal on a contemporary sculpture on one hand, but it also came, and I was interested in the, the low-level disappointment or frustration that might have in having been a complicit consumer uh, by participating in the project, and it, of course the owner of a thing that didn't do anything, um, and like the dilemma that these objects both uh, point to and reveal. <coughs> Untitled project VHS Slacker. This is, uh, in 2005, um, a project for Laura Reynolds Gallery in Austin, Texas. And this is essentially the main parts of the project. It was a video rental store inside the gallery where viewers could rent the video of the movie Slacker by Richard Linkletter. And you could rent it at increasing rates. Um, for three days, you could, have, you could bring the tape home for $4 for three days. Uh, for $20, you could have the tape for five days. For $100, you could have it for seven days. And for 10 or more, the price topped out at $500, kind of thinking about that being kind of more towards the art gallery price. And so shifting from being like a movie rental price to the art gallery price. Of course, Slacker, the film, um, is a classic now. It was filmed in Austin, Texas. And it's, it's kind of a strange love letter to the town. Um, as the narrative and the film camera literally drifts from one character setting to another, there's this mapping that happens that slowly, gradually kind of reveals the, tra the town or the city as in a kind of drifting way. I was interested in the old technology of the videotape being, at this point, 2005, is there still were videotapes that existed for rent, um, but they were becoming more and more obsolete. Um, and I was also enjoying the way, thinking about and trying to make these objects leave the gallery and, again, kind of map another kind of terrain on top of the city of Austin and then come back to the gallery. I was also interested in the possibility of that, given the spirit of the film, which um, there's a slight and maybe not so slight anti-capitalist, anti-work ethic in the film that maybe these rental tapes wouldn't be returned, and then um, the gallery would have been put in this position of trying to collect payment or get the, the videotape back. Um, I, <coughs> as much as I wanted that to happen, um, even though a number of tapes were rented, um, all of them were very politely returned. Um, Untitled Project Market in Geneva, it was 2006, part of a group exhibition for um, a commercial alternative gallery in Geneva. The exhibition was called Project Placement, and a number of artists produced projects that were specifically placed around the city and also kind of connected to the gallery. I was interested in the history of Geneva as sites for both the origin of the Reformation and personal timekeeping, the watch industry, two significant cultural conditions that prioritize the individual and also laid the groundwork for what we know of as the conditions of late capital or capitalism in general. Um, just down the street from the gallery was a public space, um, kind of a city square or diamond shape really, called the Place de Plain Palais, which hosted an open air flea market twice a week where individuals could sell pretty much anything. So on the day before the opening of the show, I set up a table in the flea market and sold carved and painted fake, fake Rolex watches um, for 20 Swiss francs each. And I also sold copies of Marx's Capital, um, the French paperback versions, and Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism for the same amount. I also had, um, I made copies of my Swiss Army knife and gave them away as souvenirs for the experiences, the conversations that I would have with the people who would pass by and then try and figure out what was going on. Um, a number of the watches, the fake Rolex watches, sold. Um, and then the next day, um, for the opening, the table, along with the watches and the books and uh, some of the other <coughs> paraphernalia, 
went to the shifted to the gallery exhibition space, and where the price again shifted back to the gallery price structure as a as a single work, along with photographs of the market event. Again, I was interested in how like it would shift, like the work operated very differently out there than in the gallery space. And I'm not saying one space is better than another necessarily. I'm interested in how and why those changes might occur and, and kind of use them to, to talk about the conditions that they exist in. Untitled Project Commodity Capital was in 2007 for a group exhibition, The Irresistible Force at the Tate Modern. And for this project, I was interested in Karl Marx's Capital Volume One. This is a, a seminal text that everyone has been assigned some part of at some point in their college career, but no one has really, maybe a few people have really read the whole thing. Um, and I started looking at this as a commodity itself, as a way to kind of think about um, the ideas in the book, but also the book as, as an object commodity. Um, and if I were to purchase a new copy of this text at that time um, from Pe the Penguin Bookstore in London, it would have cost me, um, I think, 19 pounds plus shipping and handling up to, so it became 25 pounds. So I produced sculptures, I produced a sculpture of this book and also um, made up a sales flyer <coughs> order form so that uh, viewers of the exhibition, if they had, the order form was in the catalog for the show. Uh, and if you had an order form, you could um, fill it out and then send, put it in an envelope with uh, 25 pounds in cash um, and mail it to me. And then after a long time, I would um, make an object, the book for them and then, and then ship it back to them. Um, I should say that a lot of these projects don't involve me actually coming out on top and in the sense that I'm not making much money when I'm doing this. And part of that, as a professor teaching full time and at a research university, I can kind of leverage my time and space to kind of do things like this. I'm not dependent on the sale of my work to, um, to survive, so I can use the sale of my work or the sales of my work as part of the subject. Uh, something that happened or that does happen with these objects once they go to specific individuals is this sort of, um, <coughs> I often get emails from participants with, uh, it has a picture of the object in their home, almost like uh, a proof or look what I did with your thing that you made. And I'm still not quite sure what to do with these images um, I mean, I appreciate them quite a bit because it makes me think about what the dilemma they've had about where to put it or how they've talked about um, uh, how they um, position it in their home among their other objects. Untitled Project Commute. Um, this is also 2006. And I've, I've talked about the ways in which my simulated objects move through specific economies, like kind of kind of bumping or denting a trip. Is there a way to turn the volume down on that? So I made a Hot Wheels version of my car, it's a Jetta station wagon, and I mounted it to my bicycle and I had to put a video camera behind it. And I traced um, my commute from my home to school uh, and then parked the car in, in the school parking lot. There's a lot of ambient noise in this, none of which is really that crucial. Um, and, and so I was interested in the way this project repeated, repeatedly reveals the awkwardness of the illusion. Like when my bike wobbles or when the car, when another car passes by, um, it, it, it's obviously not real, but there's also moments when it kind of does look like a car driving down the road. Um, and so it allows me a way of kind of thinking about what the, the roads that I take or the time it takes from one spot to another 
or even just a way to kind of make tangible this thing that happens um, in a very unnoticed way every day or every day that I work. And of course, this is a looped video that I'm not going to show you um, the full 20, 30 minutes of it. Um, and eventually, it goes to my office at school. Uh, I do not get in any accidents. Um, and I park. There we go. Park the car. And then at the end of the day, I go home. So the same route back. You can kind of see my shadow. It's a nice moment right there. Oh, there's another one. Uh, another car project, muscle car, 1969 Pontiac GTO, The Judge. This is 2004, so a little bit before the other project. And I should preface this that I'm not um, a muscle car fanatic, and, and but I do enjoy the communities that I encounter when I get into these projects that the research um, kind of pushes me into these very specific communities around these objects and specific audiences. Um, but I, I don't always start from the audience. I usually encounter them in the process. And my primary motivation for this project came from wanting, really, it's, this is not really a very good reason necessarily, but I wanted to make a large orange thing. And so I was, and I was thinking about large objects and I also had a show, an opportunity to show at this gallery in Chicago, where this is pictured right now, called Suitable Gallery, which is literally located, located in a garage behind the residence um, near Humboldt Park. And so like, the, the context in my, this large orange object um, kind of led me to thinking about cars, and ultimately muscle cars. Um, and I ended up in 1969, this, which is the pinnacle of muscle car, of that arc of muscle cars from back then, I should say. Um, after 69, the, uh, because of the economy or because of um, technology, cars got smaller, engines got smaller, more efficient, less pollutant. Um, so it's like 69 was this moment where maybe none of that mattered. And so I was thinking about how this object came from that moment, but also now these objects are collected by um, a very specific audience that looks back in nostalgia for this time when the times that were much less regulated or even above critique. So um, I, was, I was interested in all of that, that phenomenon. The car and the exhibition was advertised in the Chicago Sun-Times in the custom modified car classifieds section, as well as uh, deals on wheels, the car, sculpt, uh, the, the, you know, the car trader magazine, and also online. Um, it was priced at, this is also another sort of, I, I didn't quite know how to think about the price of this, so I priced it at the, at the amount that I owed on the car that I had purchased, for the car that you saw, saw me drive to school. Um, I bought that and I owed that much money, so I thought this would be a nice sort of equal exchange. I could sell the DTO and I could totally pay off my car, um, car for car, <coughs> um, but that didn't happen. Um, the car sculpture is also three-quarter scale, and I don't normally modify scale, or, um, or if I do, not that much, but I was thinking about how the way in which scale changes this object and also kind of starts to question both the testosterone connected to this thing. So it becomes this diminutive version of this large idea of the car. Um, so it becomes stranger, um, I should say. Um, during the run of the exhibition, I was, I was in the <coughs> suitable gallery talking with a curator from, Chicago, who, um, from the Renaissance Society about the project. And that there's a, at, as we were talking about the car, about what it was as this conceptual art project, um, a local neighborhood car club, not the whole car club, but a few members from this car club came in because they had heard about the, the show or the project or the car. And they were looking at the car at the same time as I was, ha I was looking at the car with the curator. And I became really appreciative of this kind of, um, it was a nice moment where there's these two different conversations going on <laughs> two different audi audiences simultaneously, but there's some shared space um, 
where there's an appreciation for what the car represented, maybe not the accuracy of the vehicle, but maybe the labor or even the way that it became sort of this iconic gesture. Um, the life of the car, it, it, it traveled it through a couple different exhibitions, and at one point it went on to eBay Motors. Um, and there's this interesting moment where a car collector, a GTO collector, emailed me, and I had a series of emails that didn't happen on eBay, but happened outside <coughs> after, after this email, um, where he was very interested in the car because of, he understood exactly what it was, um, that it wasn't a real car, but it was like something that he could add to his growing collection of GTO, 1969 GTO um, things. And he even talked about how he was working through in his mind how he would build a, a special room off of his garage for the car because it, you know, it couldn't really exist in the garage. It had to be just nearby. Uh, so like, like problem solving it as an artwork, but also as it's still kind of functioning in that object state. And I didn't end up selling it to him. Um, um, for a variety of reasons that you don't have to know about. But. Uh, Untitled Project Dumpster, another large orange thing. Um, this is for Gallery 400 in Chicago, uh, part of the UI, University of Illinois in Chicago's campus. And this is when they were at their temporary location um, in the kind of a renovated grocery store while their building was being, the asbestos I think was being removed. Um, it's one-to-one -one scale. It's um, based on most any kind of dumpster. It's not incredibly specific. It is made out of wood that I salvaged from the University of Illinois main campus um, recycling station, um, thinking about this as some kind of inter-campus exchange. But I was interested in the ways in which dumpsters pointed to both, of course, the industry of waste. The dumpsters are where we throw things away, usually large things or large quantities of things. Um, but in Chicago, like in many other cities, the presence of a dumpster also becomes one of those signals of gentrification, of change is happening. Something's being renovated or something's being torn down. And so like this increase in property value might be one of the first reactions or, oh no, my rent's increasing. Uh, the dumpster functioned for a series of months collecting uh, trash. Um, and also becoming a receptacle for recyclables to be collected from it. So like glass you know, beer bottles were thrown in, beer bottles were taken out and cashed in. Um, it became um, kind of an active site for what I, I'm assuming to be a student project. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is, the dead body project or, but I placed it here thinking about it as you know, a possible place for um, the students to interact with anyway, almost like a platform or a stage. It received a tag that I assumed to be official, and the city did too, and the, the anti-graffiti <laughs> removal agency came and painted over it. Um, I don't have, uh, at one point also, in the, as it was in the snow, the plows came through and they they took the object, or this, the dumpster, and they kind of pushed it all the way over to the edge of the plaza so they could make, you know, plow <laughs> easier. So there's a, it was an artwork, um, it was a sculpture, but it was also this thing that um, literally got in the way. Or in many cases, as people came to see the show, they would go walk right by it, go into the gallery and say, well, where's the project? Uh, it ended up, I emptied the dumpster in the dumpsters behind the building. Um, I was going to dismantle it and throw it all away, but Dan Peterman, the artist, uh, he was rebuilding his experimental station studios building um, at south of Chicago at that time, and he needed a dumpster to show the city when they came by saying, where's your dumpster? And you could point to it and say, there's my dumpster. So it, it lived there for a, a few more years, and then it's now gone somewhere else. Uh, it's more, more of a domestic or <coughs> interior scaled um, trash project, um, Untitled Project Trash. And I made a series of these trash bins that collect trash during the course of an exhibition, um, creating a dilemma both for some museums that don't quite know what to do with the trash once it goes in the, in the container, um, but also 
in gallery spaces, it creates another quandary of um, if the trash is part of the work, um, do they keep it or does it become more of a functional trash bin? Uh, this, I've shown them in a number of different places and um, one of the places was the Hyde Park Art Center for a big group show about Chicago alternative galleries. And I give them two trash bins and they had them in different places. And at the end of the show, I went to go pick it up and um, they could only find one of them. <coughs> and they were really apologetic, kind of. And I went home kind of very disgruntled. And then almost two years later, so two years later, um, they emailed me saying, we found your trash bin. And apparently the whole time it had been in the ladies' restroom um, in constant use. And at some point someone said, hey. So I like thinking about like that added narrative to this object as um, having a, a very nice life. Untitled Project donations. Uh, this is uh, kind of an object thing based on the ubiquitous donation kind of appeal to the public um, for lots of nonprofit spaces, museum spaces. Uh, and th these are objects that no one really knows where this money goes um, or if it really helps. But it, it, it's like this public sort of, like, we need your money from the museum and or the alternative space and, and the public feeling guilty enough when they walk by it that they should contribute. And I'm sure there's probably real genuine donations that happen but I would think that the bigger donations happen outside of the physical space of the gallery, museum. Um, this donation box only has one um, entrance for money. It, it, there's no other, um, it's solid except for that hole where the money goes in. And it's designed that way so that um, as it goes from one exhibition to another, and it's been in a number of exhibitions, um, even internationally, um, it's slowly, and very literally um, <coughs> increasing in value. The more it gets shown, the more it gets heavier, and I mean, it's literally, there's more money in it. Um, I, I showed this briefly, the eBay Tupperware project, um, and I've done a number of projects on eBay, using eBay. This is the first one. It was for a show at the Tang Museum, and I was, in my research of objects and things, eBay became, especially early eBay, late eBay, late eBay, which is right now, is less interesting because everyone got really smart about what things were worth and what things are, um, and the photographs got really good, and it's, it's not as, it's not as um, gritty as it used to be. But in, in the early eBay stages, um, Tupperware was often bought and sold by you, know, you and me and our neighbors um, because we don't use these things or they became excessive or maybe they're slightly collectible but not really valuable. Um, and as I was collecting these auctions, I no started noticing that there's strategies that are very visual, strategies that are visual that mimic maybe some of the minimalist strategies of the 60s of you know, one object after another, uh, but also strategies to kind of hide the fact that maybe the set of six um, Tupperware measuring cups looks like it has all the Tupperware measuring cups, but it doesn't. So like a way to hide information or just to make it more dynamic and interesting. Um, during the course of the exhibition, one set of Tupperware measuring cups was sold every week. Um, and I, I put the museum in charge of shipping the, you know, the, the objects to the highest bidder, um, both as a way of kind of using the museum to do things that they don't normally do. And they had to kind of go through their um, not that the Tang is that official, but there was this process of them trying to figure out what they were allowed to do and what they um, weren't allowed to do. And you can't sell things in a museum space, but since eBay is outside of the museum, they were able to kind of work out with the lawyers that this could actually happen. Um, another, shortly after that, I did this project um, focusing on Eames shell, shell chairs, these flat, these kind of curved chairs made by Charles and Ray Eames. You know, this history of this design object, Ray Eames studied with Hans Hoffman. Hans Hoffman was all about the push-pull of color in a painting. His paintings are really kind of dreadfully garish, but they, they create this retinal thing, pops. Um, and I started, as I was collecting images again of these objects on eBay, I noticed that there is this popping thing of color in space, 
that happened when these chairs were being photographed. So I transla translated that effect, like when I noticed that I collected the image and I made a painting of it, <laughs> and then I put those images, those paintings, back onto eBay in the same category with the same title and also starting at the same price as a way of kind of, again, doing this kind of doubling or repetition of these objects through that space, through that economy. Um, these are also very small paintings. That I made the paintings the same size as the eBay images, which back then were very small, right, to, to load faster. So a lot of them are kind of smaller than handheld. Um, eBay, Ding, there, these are a series of paintings that are, um, this is an ongoing series that I started in um, 2008 and I'm still, I'm still making them. And these paintings are um, of mid-century modern furniture, um, this collectible <laughs> object which has a lot of currency on eBay. And uh, um, in these auctions, if there's something wrong with the furniture, if there's a scratch or a dent or um, a tear in the fabric, there's usually one or two images that reveal that. Like this is the part, and it's kind of this honesty pledge that eBay sellers kind of go through where they, they show the flaw as a way to kind of both prove that it's real, or that, that they haven't kind of, they're not lying about anything. Um, and also with these images, there's some kind of marking device of you know, a hand or a pen a finger generally that kind of intrudes into the picture plane. It's, it's almost, <laughs> for me, these images are a lot like John Baldessari's instruction paintings, um, but they also become these strange abstract moments of dings, of dents that, um, on one hand, these dents devalue the object that's being sold. On the other hand, um, these dings, these dents, are part of the object's history, it's part of the object's narrative. The story of the thing often exist in these moments of the object more than any of the others. This is kind of hard to see, but this is a marble uh, serenin tabletop that's been scratched. A uh, few more projects. Um, Untitled Project Seasonal Economies Fall Sale. This is part of a larger show that I produced for the Burlington Contemporary Arts Center in Vermont. Um, it was a show that happened in the fall. And part of the research, again, and these opportunities come up as either out of my research or um, they come up and I do research on the place where they're going, thinking about the site as being pretty important for the work. Um, and if you know Vermont, one of the biggest products that Vermont sells is the fall season. And they have the copyright on autumn. And if you want to sell autumn, you have to go through them, apparently. Uh, in New Hampshire, it's, the fall season is not as nice as in Vermont. Or so you know, they would like, their advertisers would like you to think. So I, I started thinking about the fall, how, do, how, that, how it, in what ways does this become a commodity? Um, so um, I made sculptures of leaves from internet images of fall leaves that were photographed from Vermont. So it's like, you know, someone takes a picture of the fall leaf saying, look, it's fall. They post it online. I, I started collecting those and I started making sculptures of those. And then I put those sculptures um, for sale during the show, um, for the run of the show, online, but also in space. And the price of the leaves was based on the price it was that you would pay if you were to go to a bed and breakfast in Vermont for, um, I think it's a two-day minimum. So uh, it was like less than $1,000, but it was still pretty expensive. And if you know anything about fall and the fervor of what they call the peak of autumn, there's this moment, this magical moment in autumn where the leaves are at their best. And no one exactly knows what that means, but everyone knows what that means. Um, and so during these two weeks, which is roughly end of September, early October, the prices in all of these hotels and bed and breakfast go up. So the prices of these leaves fluctuated with the prices of the hotels as a way to kind of, if you got in early, you could get the leaves cheaper. If you waited till the peak, then you had to pay more. I also sold photographs, uh, postcards of 
Autumn in Vermont that were um, that came from an eBay seller from India as a way to kind of also kind of talk about this, the global commodity market of Vermont's <laughs> autumn. Um, one of the main projects that was uh, sign dollar store, and Vermont is very politically opposed, socially and politically opposed to the Walmart box store, the, both the big and the small box stores. Um, and so they, they've been fighting dollar store. Dollar store kind of fits in under the wire with some of the build uh, the city codes because they're smaller and they can they can go inside some of these older, smaller buildings. And so they've been fighting. Um, also, uh, this is the, the map, the online map of the, the leaf colors that change. Um, so you can go and click on this website that's usually connected to NPR or some of the news websites. You can find out exactly where the leaves are red or orange or yellow. So I turned, I made a, a dollar store sign, um, it, installed it inside the gallery space. And using this information, um, every, every week the sign became um, repainted according to the map so that it became like this tangible or more of a more physical version of, uh, of the weather or the fall indicator. So over the course of the show, um, in Vermont, the leaves turn red soonest in the middle because that's where the mountains are. So, and then so it's kind of this like fade in out effect. So over the course of the show, the dollar sign changed. Um, I wasn't there painting it every time. Of course, there's a, a gallery assistant that would receive my instructions and then they would paint these different tints onto the letters. Um, so by the end of the show, all the leaves are brown. <coughs> And I was waiting for the first snow to paint the whole sign white again, but that never happened um, before the show ended. I also, during the show, I made flyers at, um, as quickly as I could, flyers of every month. So in September I made, um, I went to Dollar General, got the flyer and made a sculpture painting of it and then sent it to the gallery. And then um, for October, did the same, November the same as a way to kind of keep it current or thinking about the, in, in uh, consumer culture, the, uh, the fall season is also a, a consumer season. Um, just like everything right now is geared towards Halloween and then Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then whatever. Okay, um, produce tomato, I made a tomato plant. I, I grow tomatoes in my front yard. Um, I don't live off of what I grow. So I began looking at this activity very critically as this is both, this is good because everyone knows that growing tomatoes is good, right? It's like, it's not a bad thing. Um, but it, I also started thinking about this as part of this strange leisure activity that we grow things that some people use to survive, but we grow them for fun or to kind of just say, yeah, I grow tomatoes. I made some salsa. Um, I was watching the tomato plants grow and during the course of the summer, I had a show planned in the fall. Um, I constructed a tomato plant and tried to think about it growing in my studio space. Um, uh, I, I didn't, at, even at this point in the project, I didn't quite know if I would be able to do it. I was kind of learning to make it as I was making it. Um, some parts fell off and I had to kind of reconfigure my strategy. Um, so it became a way of thinking about my labor, um, the object as some indicator of time or investment of time, um, and also strangely equating like the leisure tomato plant um, with the leisure art object. Both exist in this kind of non, not really functional space, um, and, which, and I think that space could be critical space too. Um, Honda CB77 Superhawk, um, this is the motorcycle that is one of the main protagonists of this book, even though it's never really mentioned. Um, this is the motorcycle that the driver, it's fi somewhere fiction, between fiction and autobiography um, by Robert Piercig. Um, and I began thinking about like how the romantic kind of maintenance of a motorcycle might be equated to um, my own studio practice of making and thinking about this kind of ongoing um, the kind of the, both um, the task of making, the act of making as a way of thinking about maintenance. Um, 
And so this, this is a, a one-to-one scale model of, of um, this motorcycle. Uh, is built for an exhibition in, for the, uh, about motorcycles in Lyon, France, at the Contemporary Art Museum there. So I was also having to think about how it would break apart into three pieces for shipping, um, which m motorcycle maintenance people wouldn't have to think about. But it became th th this whole phenomenon of um, the rebuilding of a motorcycle. Um, I was interested in how that and my studio might have some kind of overlap or some kind of um, shared space. And again, I'm not like a, I've never really ridden a motorcycle that I know of. Um, a moped doesn't count, I was told. Um, and so, and so I would have these conversations with people who are very, very invested into this object or these objects. Uh, and I, I can go up to a certain point in those conversations before the fact that I don't ride um, becomes a problem. Uh, Walden, of course, <coughs> appears a lot in, this, in my work, and this is actually the only book that the main character took with him on his romantic journey across the United States. Uh, the other part of this project is a series of paintings of the same motorcycle, but broken down into individual parts from eBay again. So thinking again about this fragmented motorcycle, if you were to rebuild the motorcycle, you'd pick up these parts using eBay or these online sources. Um, anything you want, Untitled Project, anything you want. I've, this is one of maybe two more that I'll show and then I'll open it up. Um, this is a product that is based on the phenomenon of the commissioned object. Uh, as an artist, there's collectors sometimes feel privileged to ask you to make something for them. Um, but then it comes with this caveat that they want you to make this something really specific, um, specific to them. And I, I'd also get um, suggestions unsolicited, um, mostly from my family, of like, you should make this object, or you should make. So I was thinking about like, well, their desire for me to make something was different than my desire to make something. So I was trying to think about how that would play out, and how that does play out in terms of what they want versus what I want. So I turned it into a project where um, I, I open it up to anyone, this is ongoing, where if someone wants me to make a fake version of a thing that they <coughs> either don't have anymore or they just want a fake version of the thing that they do have, um, or if it's, I mean, th there's various reasons why people want these things. This is a, a pink eraser, pig eraser that someone dropped in the Long Island Sound. Um, and we had to construct this based on her very rough memory of this object. Um, Jeff Koons' rabbit, a collector in New York, um, wants to own this object, thinks it's one of the best sculptures of all time, um, but apparently museums own the three copies of it, so he can't technically own it, so I made a slightly scaled down version for him. Uh, the greatest Michael Jordan poster of all time. Again, like these narratives of why these individuals wanted these things become part of this project in a really important way. Um, about remembering this object that they had, that they couldn't find, it, that they can't find anymore. Um, or Miles Davis, kind of blue. This is, actually, some of you might have met Ben Grosser, who was my lecture to you last, uh, last year or spring. Um, but he, uh, when his mother died, he got her copy of Kind of Blue. And then he found another copy in, the, in a used record store. But then he mixed them up, and he doesn't know which one's his mother anymore or which one's the one that he bought. And so there's this kind of hidden dilemma. So I kind of merged the images of both records into one fake record to embody his problem. Um, a watch, a Swiss Army knife that belonged, that was given to them by their grandfather, who, which was then taken away from them by the TSA. A ring. A, Polaroid photo shot by inmate while our family was visiting my father in the Nevada State Prison. So again, like these objects that, um, I mean, th this is an object that this individual owns and kind of keeps, um, but they also, maybe the, 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 at, the request to remake it comes more from a place of not knowing how to deal with these things because maybe they're charged or maybe they're um, just strange, um, objects already. 
Um, it, this project also involves very sliding, a sliding scale in terms of um, part of the contract and application involves them suggesting a value of what they would pay to have a fake version of the thing that they want. Or there's a barter option as well, and sometimes there's combinations of both payment and barter. Um, <clears throat> but like with the collector who has more resources and uh, um, the price of that sculpture is very different than the price of this sculpture, um, thinking about the specificity of, of the commission and of the relationship of me to this participant as being um, an important part of this project. And, and one other comment about that project is it kind of came out of this, this notion too, of this question of can an artwork be made for just one other person um, and like what that would mean or what that would look like. Um, I'm not going to talk about this project. You can look at it online if you want. And this is the project that's in the Wright Museum right now. Um, it's a making a surrogate version of Robert Smithson's library. Robert Smithson died in 74 in a plane crash, and when he died, um, an art historian, PhD student, cataloged all of his books, and they boxed them, and they went into the archives of American art in the Smithsonian. Um, and the, this list of books has appeared in a couple different places um, in monographs about Robert Smithson's work, and I became fascinated by what this list represented and why it existed at all, why Smithson's <laughs> library and why not someone else's. Um, and it, it has something to do with Smithson being a very uh, diversely interested individual, interested in everything from science fiction to magic to geology, um, not maybe your typical art book collector. Um, but anyway, these books are not really accessible. You can go to the archives and order the boxes, and they'll bring them out one by one. And you can kind of go through them with white gloves. So I thought my version will be the version that you can see all in one space and have some sense of what these books are, because you can't see them all right now. Um, this project is still ongoing. Of, I'm slightly more than halfway there. Um, but I still have a lot of books to make. And there's also the book club portion of this project where participants can be, anyone can participate in the project, become a member of the book club. Um, so there's a primary archive, which is this collection of books um, that will stay fixed. And then, and then the book club part, I'm making a second book of any book that anyone requests, only one additional copy. Um, and those books will be made for those individuals, those members of the book club, and shipped to them. And I'm interested in how those books become part of the secondary or a distributed archive. Um, and if you know Smithson's site, non-site um, terminology, he's interested in both the gallery space but also the world and how, how to navigate that problem. Um, the secondary archive becomes a non-site to this main archive. Um, which, of course, is also a non-site to the main site of the actual library. And the, the members are requested to send pictures of them with their book in their site. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of create a, a mapping, again, of the secondary archive so it becomes like this. These are books that have been collected and then been distributed all around the world. Um, the selection of these books also plays into this very personal, subjective um, space of what the participants want, um, um, thinking about what Smithson might have liked or what authors they enjoy. Um, I won't talk about this one. Um, this is currently in another exhibition in France where I made um, paintings of Georges Perec's Things, his novel Things. Um, as sold on the French versions of eBay. And so these paintings are all collected. And uh, this project is going to be, untitled project, Free Beer. It's going to be at the Ski Club um, in Milwaukee <coughs> a week from Saturday, right? So October 9? Yeah. Um, thank you. So I'll take any questions. <laughs>
we, do we have time for questions? Is, what questions do you have? Oh. I think they want you to talk in the microphone. Does anyone ever recognize your sculptures in the kind of like public sales that you do before you do your quote gallery sales? You mean like when they go into grocery stores or? I guess, or I'm wondering if it ever, if you've ever encountered people, I guess, stalking you, trying to like find your works or? <coughs> no, I, I hide pretty, I, I hide, so no, partly because I mean, I know, I know that's a phenomenon, like with ours, like um, J.S. Boggs, who makes the dollar, mm -hmm. prints those dollar bills, and then collectors are supposedly following him to the store. When, um, I'm not interested in that so much at all, actually, because it, it, it creates this really strange relationship of assumed value. And I like more the problematic value of, of is this thing really worth that price? Um, or if I had this money, would I buy the real thing, or would I buy, you know, this fake version of the thing? Um, it takes some internal negotiation to do that, and I have had people tell me that they're tracking me on eBay just to get into, you know, the first dibs, I guess, of the eBay auction. But really, that doesn't happen. I kind of mix it up enough so that. Hi, thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, I have a question. I wonder, something that really sort of stuck out to me was um, <clears throat> you, we were, you were pointing out the sort of the strangeness of labor in like consumer whatever, like circles and mm -hmm. like circles of consumption and stuff like that. But it's something that really stuck out to me was how this uh, cap well, this cap capitalist system is just sort of saturated with emotions, and how emotions are sort of like so much the driving force of these circles of buying. I don't know if you could, if that's something that you've like thought about of how like the the dude who was trying to buy the car because that's like he just collected cars. It's, it's it goes beyond the utility of the object. Right. That's like, well, I mean, you, you could get into Marx here really easily by talking about the commodity fetish, um, the fetishism of the commodity. Um, and how it's like the, the desire for the thing almost precedes the thing, and it, it, and it does that because of the levels of abstraction that happen in capitalism or through capitalism. Um, but, it, but I also think that those emotions are, are pretty genuine, or that they're not, not genuine, let me put it that way. I mean, I think that people feel things and those feelings are real. So um, it, I think it's a delicate balance of how I'm thinking about the desire for these things might actually come from a very sincere place. Um, so I'm not interested in just critiquing that as much as kind of talking about, well, what does it mean to want this thing? Um, and how that wanting, talking about that wanting is part of a negotiation of, of you know, self and objects and, and the culture that we live in, yeah. And sort of as a follow-up, do you see any difference between those who desire the object as for some like the whatever you want uh, ones with the m like nostalgic memories and those who desire it as sort of an art object who are art collectors. Like what are the, I don't know, the emotions behind both of those desires? The, the, the participants who are not part of the art collecting audience have very different relationships to things, right. these things. Right. Um, and in many cases, they might not even think about it as an art object, but as some kind of strange duplicate of the thing that they want. Um, not all the time, but those worlds don't always overlap, or when they do, it gets kind of weird. Like when um, I've had collectors figure out, have to figure out how to use eBay to buy something <laughs> of mine, and, and in one case, they actually had the gallery do it for them, and it became this really convoluted process of, of what everyone should or obviously knows how to do anyway, but you know, it, they were kind of so distant from their money and from even buying that they had to be walked through. But yeah.
How did, or what caused you to originally start doing these things, your, your projects, your art? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, I was making art for a long time, and I wasn't always making art like this. Um, when I was in grad school, I was thinking and looking at found objects, and I liked thinking about these objects and their stories. So my work then was actually a lot more narrative. I was thinking about these as props. Like I was making fake objects, or I was make, using found objects first, and then I painted on found objects, and then I decided that I was losing control still, so I started making them from out of wood and paint. And at that point, I, um, I was hoping to kind of create these kind of invisible characters. And then it kind of just grew from there to thinking about um, these, I mean, those stories became kind of closed for me. So I was thinking about the, putting the garage sale and other projects started, had me putting these things in the world and seeing what stories would start to emerge from them. So that's, that's like the 30 second version of, <laughs> of how, I, how I got to that point. But, I mean, it, it comes back to an interest in, I've always collected things, but I've always made things. Um, my, <coughs> I always have this question about if I'm a sculptor or a painter, my degrees are in painting, and I make all my sculptures based upon like these three weeks from my intro to sculpture class. Um, and I've never told that professor that I use his information <laughs> that much. Um, I didn't really get along with him really, but um, but like so, it, it's like that kind of status about like what, where these things come from. It's not necessarily a traditional path either. So, yeah. thank you. Um, so I work at the Wright Museum, and we're told as uh, to inform guests that the trash can in the exhibit is wood as well, which I thought was interesting in that when you were talking about it, you talked about different galleries and museum spaces interacting with it, of like, what do we do with this? And do people put trash in there and stuff? But I don't know, because and that just made me wonder, and I know you said that you don't prioritize one space over the other for showing your work, but I mean, do you think it compromises or, or takes away some, some of the interesting aspects of your work when it's in this kind of higher up museum or gallery space? <coughs> yeah, um, like the fact that you're not allowed to touch the books, I think is a problem, but I can't do anything <coughs> about that. When I did the used book sale, at, I did it at Printed Matter Art Book Fair at PS1 in New York. And there, there was no barrier or even assumption of a barrier and people manhandled or human handled these books like crazy, and uh, which is great because the interaction of touching it suddenly became like, well, what is this in a very physical way? Um, and I, I don't think that museums are necessarily harder, but they're very different spaces. Um, even this museum compared to Utah where the library was first held, um, they sent me some pictures because someone at some point moved one of the books on the tables like over four inches and they sent me like before and after pictures of like this, this happened, we're really sorry. As like, I mean, they're very heightened. Uh, their, their attention about the space is really heightened. Um, and that's, again, that's not necessarily good or bad. It's just a very different set of conditions that I have to kind of factor into. It does make it harder to kind of um, trick the viewer or kind of play with that kind of a, that threshold. Um, when, when viewers walk into museums, they know that what they're looking at is art, so it, I mean, it, the stakes are higher. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you, with your works being generally sort of low grade copies, um, which in like other processes that involve that kind of often seem to devolve into parody and uh, like satire. And I'm wondering how you view your work as parody or not parody, affectionate parody, if you thought about that at all, as far as whether or not you are like embracing the love of say a muscle car thing, like right. not necessarily that muscle cars are dumb, but it's like something that is no, separate a, from you. That's a good question because I mean, irony kind of, it, or parody kind of, um, assumes some kind of distance that, that I'm not part of that experience. 
So I, I like to think about like when I've done those installations or when I've you know, put things into other contexts like grocery stores, that I'm not trying to trick anyone. It's more like a joke that someone might happen upon. It's like using humor or just even um, a question like, well, what is this? This is dumb. That being a possible um, entrance to the work in a way that um, being fooled or playing the parody card might assume a sort of elevation of the object or myself of the with the object in relationship to the viewer. I mean, it, I think viewers are great. So, and without them, we, you know, the artworks wouldn't work. So, I'm, I'm interested in, in the multiplicity of the experiences that they might bring, rather than telling them what they should think or, you know. You know. Does that answer your question? Um, yes. Although I'm curious if you, if there's any specific uh, formal or like practical, as it in your practice, methods that you've taken on yourself to avoid being parody. Well, I think one thing is, is that I don't make them that realistic. I mean, they're kind of clunky, and that could be seen or often is seen as funny or funny or dumb, both. Um, and that allows it to kind of have this maybe a greater threshold of of uh, an experience than if it were to be really detailed or you know, photorealistic, then it might assume to have a status that is different. So that's one way. Thanks. Um, I have a question. You make these objects and they're moving around in space and time and economies and they're very nebulous in their existence and yet I feel like I've heard you four times refer to them specifically as carved out of wood and painted. Um, I don't usually ask materials question, but somehow that begs the question of why is, is that specifically important mm -hmm. to say they are carved out of wood and painted? Um, sometimes I say that because when I show images, they become real things too quickly if, it, if the resolution is bad or if eyesight is bad. Um, but wood also became a common denominator that I could sort of fall back on. Wood replicates things most anything, not everything, but a lot of things. Um, it holds the same weight of some of the things in terms of scale, like the book made out of wood and a real book. Um, there's some, some he similar heft. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it, it kind of, it became something that once everything was made out of wood, it didn't come into play as like, you know, if, if there's a change in materials, then there would be a change in content. So it was like this common denominator of um, um, where it didn't become an issue. The kind of wood does change sometimes, but not because um, it's more structural, like some of the leaves and some of the more detailed things. I've learned how to make things out of soft maple. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's pine and, yeah. But yeah, I've often said that Woodworking Magazine really doesn't want anything to do with me because I'm not really a woodworker and my, my woodworking skills might be decent, but they're not traditional or even proper according to some of these rules. So that's also another thing. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and let's thank Conrad for sharing his work with us tonight.